have you ever felt like, have you ever felt, you know, what, what do I matter? I kind of just slide under the radar of maybe what's going on in the grand scheme of God's plans. And I'm just, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm not anybody important. Anybody felt like that? I might have felt like that a lot. Sometimes you, you feel like you're just sort of, you know, uh, a cog in the machine, a nut in the wheelhouse. You're a nut, but um, we're all nuts. But the point of it is, is, you know, I mean, if, we're, if I'm honest, I think sometimes we can feel kind of insignificant, don't we? And one of the great privileges that I have as a pastor is I know so many of your stories. Now, some of your stories I don't know, but so many of them I do know. And here's what I know. I know that just even in a congregation this size, we have, we have, we have single parents, for, for one, who have endured really difficult seasons and have sort of dug in and done the right thing, and they're raising their kids, and they're, it's hard. And we got, we got families like that in our, in our community. Um, we, have, we have grandmas and grandpas who have already raised their kids but are now raising grandkids. We have those, those folks in our, in our church. We have, we have married couples who have endured unbelievably hard things, either in their marriage where they, 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 they bordered, you know, they, they teetered right on the brink of divorce, and yet they stuck it out, they dug it out, they learned some things about each other, they kept their families together so that they could raise their kids effectively. We got those folks in our, in our, in our church. We have folks that have gone through extraordinary health issues and still, still sort of stuck it, stuck it out and went, you know, got through it and raised their families. And we have young people who have endured unbelievably dysfunctional childhoods, that they've gone through just all kinds of dysfunction, and yet they haven't allowed it to, to destroy their faith or, or to, to steer them off course. They've, they've continued to move forward in their faith. They educated themselves. They're moving forward in life. And so we've got all these. I could go on and on and on and on and on. It's one of the, one of the privileges I have of being a pastor. Now, here's what I know. When you're, when you're part of that, when you're part of that, those those types of situations it can be really you can kind of feel like you're just you're you're all alone you're just sort of digging out life as best you can and it's hard and what what difference do I make anybody ever felt like that I felt like that we're gonna we're gonna look today at a passage of scripture um, kind of an unlikely an unlikely text that sort of jumps out a little bit at me that focuses kind of shines the light on these types of situations ordinary people doing ordinary things but but and, and enduring just sort of ordinary life because life is tough isn't it and yet God God kind of takes a moment and pauses and reflects on these folks just for a moment and I, I know it encouraged me when I read through it today and I think it'll encourage you today today as well let's pray together Lord, I thank you for your presence in our midst, and I thank you that you are a strong, a powerful God, a mighty God, a God that's a great privilege for us to serve, um, a God that has worked out the plan of human redemption and, and that br is bringing salvation to the world. I'm grateful that we can put our trust and our hope in you and that, um, as your word tells us, that, that through you all things are made new, including ourselves, new creations in you. So I thank you for that. I thank you for uh, celebrating the Lord's table with your people, and, and I thank you for your word and for your spirit. Guide us, Lord, by that word and by that spirit, shaping us, making us more and more like you, and more and more in tuned to the mission that you've called each of us to. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 9, picking up where we left off before we did our Stuck series. And uh, this is the, the, the focus of Acts is changing a little bit. Acts, as you, as you may remember, was written by Luke. Luke was the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. So what we mean by that is it means he wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile. All of us, unless we are of Jewish heritage, we are Gentiles. Turn to your neighbor and say, you a Gentile. So this is who, this is, this is who uh, Luke was. He was likely of Greek descent. And uh, he spent his time with, 
with, uh, with Paul, and he knew some of the other apostles, and so he, he, he's writing of these accounts, things that he experienced, things that he knew. One of the things that's unique about Luke, as opposed to some of the other New Testament writers, is he takes a second, and he, he sort of pauses on it, and, and shines a light onto a lot of people that sometimes get overlooked, people that would be overlooked in that culture and in that community. He, would, he, would, he talked a lot about widows and, and orphans and, and uh, people who were crippled and beggars and people that people that were not Jewish and would sort of be uh, passed over in that culture. And right now, the place where we are in the in the text of Acts is Acts is in a transition point. The first part of it, the first nine chapters, deal with um, the ministry to the Jewish people. Christianity came out of Judaism, so it focuses largely on what's happening in Jerusalem with these Jewish believers. And it and it and it goes up to the point that Saul who was like, he, you know, Saul was super Jew. He would soon become the Apostle Paul, and he gets radically saved. So he's, remember we looked at that a few weeks ago. He's on the road to Damascus to, to persecute Christians, and he gets radically, extraordinarily saved. And, it's, and there's this, um, this amazing thing of story of how Paul goes back into the community, and people are trying to figure out, what do we do with, with, with Saul? It's, it's, you know, it's so extraordinary. But what like any skilled writer, what Luke does is he kind of paints these, these, these big pictures and then he'll focus in on some, something small or something more intimate. And that's what he's doing. The, the, the language or the, the, uh, the, the narrative transition is going to move from the Jewish Christians to the ministry to the Gentiles. And it's going to begin, the next three chapters of Acts are going to focus on the, the ministry of Peter. So it's kind of moving from the 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 Jews in Jerusalem to the from the Apostle Paul to now Peter and the and the ministry throughout the region region to the Gentiles, and uh, with that kind of as a backdrop, turn to chapter or verse number thirty two of Acts nine. It says, as Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda. Now, what's happening, or Luda actually would be how it be pronounced in, uh, in, in the, the, the Greek pronunciation. What's happening is these, the, the, the gospel has scattered throughout these regions, so people are, are being saved. And so, so Lydda was, about, was a town about uh, 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And so Peter, representing the apostles, he's going throughout these regions. He's meeting with these new disciples. He's teaching them. He's kind of helping them establish their churches, establish their faith. So he's just sort of, he's just traveling up, checking up on everybody. And he's meeting with the saints in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. The language may indicate that he'd been actually bedridden since he was eight. It's hard to know specifically, but at least he was paralyzed for the last eight years. We don't know hardly anything about Aeneas. He doesn't show up anywhere else in Scripture. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. So he just does this very simple thing. He sees Aeneas. Aeneas is probably a believer. We don't know for sure. He may be an unbeliever, but different theologians speculate different things. But because he's part of the saints there, and because Peter meet, met him as he was meeting other Christians in the region, Aeneas was probably a Christian as well. So he, he meets this paralyzed man. Maybe some of the disciples brought Peter to him because they knew they'd heard the great stories of Peter healing people, and maybe they thought he would be able to heal Aeneas as well. We don't really know. He might have been walking down the street of this small town and seen him and just went up and talked to him. Uh, Peter certainly had done this before. He'd healed people in Jerusalem and his, you know, the, his, the, 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 his, God's ability to work through, the fact that God worked through Peter would have been well known. So it's like, so we don't really know all of the circumstances. It's interesting that Luke, who normally goes through such great detail, is sort, sort of lacks uh, uh, some detail on this one. So, so he leans up to him and says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Now, the fact that he knew his name is some indication that he'd been introduced in some capacity. Get up and take care of your mat, he says, or get up and uh, roll up your mat, basically. Essentially saying, make up your bed, take your bed and, and uh, fold it up. 
Immediately, Aeneas got up, and all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So all the folks throughout the region, they see this remarkable story, this remarkable um, healing that happens to this, un this unremarkable guy, just a simple guy who had been paralyzed. And this, this echoes some things that Jesus had done. You remember Jesus had done this on numerous occasions. Paul would have, would have similar kinds of healings as well. So sort of, a, sort of a mirror activity of some things that, that Jesus had done. You remember there were several occasions where Jesus healed people and told them to pick up their mats and, and go home. So it's kind of echoing and mirroring some things that Christ himself had done. Now, another 12 miles up the road, there was a larger city named Joppa. And in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. So there's this woman. We don't really know a lot about her other than she was well-liked. She, she, she was surrounded by a bunch of widows, so she may have been a widow herself, probably was a widow herself, but she was known for her kind deeds. She's part of the family of faith. People really love this woman. She's known uh, for caring for the needy and for the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. Her body was washed and placed in the upstairs room. So you would go through a process of, of washing, anointing, preparing them for death. They likely went through this process, put her in an upstairs room to, to kind of go through sort of a grieving process. But, some, but because Lydda is so close to Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was in Lydda, just 12 miles down the road. So, so uh, Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. So basically, it's a simple story. They, they're, they're, two things are happening. First of all, they, they know that Peter, Peter is known for being used by God to, to do these remarkable miracles. Secondly, so it was, it was the, the main emphasis of the gospel in that first century community was the resurrection of the body. So they believed that the, a big part of their faith was that many of them had experienced, they had seen Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. They'd heard the stories, they believed it. So maybe they're thinking, this is, this is something, if we, if we wait a little bit longer, the resurrection will come. But w whatever the details are, they certainly know a, that there is a resurrection of the body, and B, that Peter is close by, who was, who was one of the guys that knew Jesus. He's the lead apostle. He's teaching all of this remarkable doctrine. God is using him extraordinarily. So they're basically saying, hey, let's wait a little bit. Let's prepare her for, prepare her for burial, but let's not, let's not bury her just yet. Let's see, let's see what Peter, what God can do through Peter. So they go get him, and they say, please come at once. This also echoes some stories that we heard about Jesus. If you remember, there was a time when his good friend had died, and, and the disciples sent, uh, sent for her. Remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus dies. Their, his friends send for him, and they say, come at once. But Jesus delays, and Lazarus dies, and he comes, and he raises them up. These, have been, these would have been stories that people would know, and this is sort of mirroring and echoing that story itself. Peter went with him, in verse number 39, it says, Peter went with him, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him, or that Tabitha had made. Both names, Tabitha and Dorcas, one is an Aramaic word, the other is a Greek word, mean gazelle. So she, she's a seamstress. So, it's, so now Luke is adding a little bit of... Um, Information that I, to me is kind of endearing. The, these widows, these when widows in that culture would have been really marginalized. If you were, if you were a widow, you were left destitute. You didn't have, you know, you, it's, you wouldn't be able to spend your husband's pension or things like that. So you would often be left without much resource other than the, the, the care of other people. And so these widows, whether, whether or not Tabitha was a part of that community, likely she was, or, or just had a soft spot in her heart for them, they had all these clothing all this clothing that she had made and probably some of them are even wearing them so picture it's a it's a really tender picture this this poor woman has died everybody loves her they're grieving her and they're showing peter the very clothes that she made for them and and probably clothes that were you know that were folded up and that people had that that were going to go out to other poor and needy people so it's this it's this picture that's 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 presented 
to us of a very tender-hearted, caring woman who was a seamstress, who cared about the poor, cared about the needy, cared about the widows. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. Once again, kind of if you can remember when, uh, when Jesus, Jesus did this with an official's daughter, a, a young lady named Talitha, and, and, and uh, he sent them all out. He did the same kind of thing, Talitha. In fact, in the, in the original, in the Greek that, that we would, or in the Aramaic that we would get this in, there's only one letter that's changed in, in what's being uh, happening here and what's happened with, the, with Jesus. And he says, Tabitha, get up. Almost exa exactly the same words that Jesus would use when he said, Talitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand, helped her to her feet. Then he called believers and the widows present to her. Uh, then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to him. So he called all of her friends back in, presented her to them alive. This, be, this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. It's a, it's a, it's a real simple story, and, and it's, it's, it, it's best seen as a bit of a prelude to the larger story of Peter's activity throughout the region. This is uh, Joppa would be a, a, a town where believers would then... Uh, be a part of the church up in Caesarea, which is where people would be saved. It became kind of the, 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 the ground base for missionary activity all throughout the rest of the book of Acts. So there's some really important things that are happening here in this region. And so the simple little story is kind of a prelude for what the rest of this ministry going on to all of the Gentiles is really all about. And it's really easy to pass over it. In fact, when I began preparation for this, when I sort of, uh, you know, wrote out my, my, uh, 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 um, my outline for Acts, and I'm kind of saying, where am I, you know, what parts of it I'm going to include, I had included this with a larger, with a larger narrative, but something kind of kept checking my spirit, and I kept kind of going back and going, no, I want to zero in on this, because it's, there's a lot of really kind of interesting things to me that are happening. It's interesting that, that Luke as he's telling the story to us, tells these two simple little stories. And something in my heart just kept telling me, nah, don't, don't, don't pass over them too quickly. Some of the things that's interesting to me is it's interesting to me that these stories so closely mirror things that Jesus had actually done. Um, and it demonstrates to me, it demonstrates the, the relationship of the disciple and the one being taught, the, dis, the disciple and the rabbi. Jesus was the rabbi. These apostles were the disciples. And throughout the ministry, Jesus would, his life with them would be, you observe me doing things. And then he would ask them to do things. And then he would sort of follow up and say, now, how did that work out? Explain things to me. And, and, and the whole point of it was imparting to them what Jesus would know to do as the rabbi. And the whole purpose of discipleship is that we learn to be like Jesus. We learn to care deeply about the things that Jesus cares about. So, we, so I don't think it's an accident that these stories so closely mirror what Jesus himself had done. Some theologians even say, well, Luke is just sort of copying the stories that happened in Jesus' life, but I don't think that's what's happening at all. I think this is what's happening. In fact, if you remember at one point, there was two stories where 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 thousands of people had come to listen to Jesus speak. And, and uh, the people had been there listening all day, and they were hungry. The disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, there's all these people. They're hungry. What do we do? He said, give them some to eat. Remember that story? And they go, we don't have any food. He says, well, that boy's got some food. They got some little fish and a few little pieces of bread. Something equivalent to what we would have as like snackables. Your kids have snackables with a little bit of cheese and crackers in it. Kid with some snackables is there. And, and one of the things that you see in the narrative is Jesus is expecting his disciples to do what he did. Bless the food. Feed the masses. But they're like, oh, we can't do that. We don't, we don't. And then Jesus does us that. He, so in other words, what he's, he's expecting the disciples to begin to walk in the power and the fullness of God. 
But they're reluctant. They're like, I don't know, we don't know how to do that. Like a lot of us would be reluctant. But then as they go through these experiences, as, as, as Peter is, is reconciled and, he's, and he's, he's equipped by the power of God and by the power of the Spirit, you see him now doing the very things that Jesus did, things he was reluctant or unwilling or unable to do before. Now we, say, we see him mirroring Jesus, Aeneas, the power of God heals you. Now pick up your mat. Tabitha, come. Echoing the very words of Jesus and these miraculous things happening. It's a reminder to me that we're supposed to do the things that Jesus did. In fact, he told his disciples at one point, you're going to do even greater things. Wow. So I read these stories, and, and I'm, but at the same time, I'm, I'm kind of filled, probably if you're like me, you've got a lot of questions. I have, the text raises some questions, doesn't it? The first questions I have is, why Aeneas? Why Tabitha? Certainly there were lots of other people that needed to be healed, huh? There are all kinds of people in Jerusalem that needed to be healed. Certainly throughout Lydda, Joppa, Caesarea, Antioch, all throughout these regions, there were people that needed to be healed. Why these two? Well, we're, never, we're not told that. But it, it, it's applicable to our day-to-day too. Why does God heal who he heals? I can't tell you the answer to that. I've, I've been healed. I've prayed and received healing. And I've prayed and not received healing. I've prayed for people who have been miraculously, divinely healed nearly instantly, and I've prayed for people sometimes for years that have never received healing. I can't explain it to you. I don't know why that is. It reminds me that healing is in God's hand, and if you've been prayed for and you haven't been healed, that means that God has a cross for you to bear that somehow in bearing that illness or that sickness, somehow in bearing that pain, you're going to be transformed into the image of Jesus. I I can't explain it to you any more than that. Other than when God moves our heart to pray for healing, for deliverance, for whatever it is we're praying for, you just pray. Did you note that Peter, before he told Tabitha to come forward, he knelt and he prayed? So it raises those questions for me. I don't know the answer to that. Nobody does. Here's what I can tell you. It tells us, though, That healing, God's answer to my prayer is not related to my faith. In other words, if I I pray for somebody's healing and they're not healed, it doesn't mean that I just have to somehow, I didn't have enough faith. And if I just conjure up enough faith, next time that person will be healed. That's not what that teaches at all. God gives us faith. Paul's very clear on that in Ephesians. That even the faith to believe is a gift from God. Which for me raises the next question. Why Peter? What was so special about Peter? I look at that, I look at that, I look at the life of Peter and I, and I, and you know, I wonder, I, he was a brash guy. He was outspoken. He got himself in trouble all the time. And I go, I've got a lot in common with Peter. That sounds a lot like me. Why Peter? Well, I can't answer that question either. Why does God choose who he chooses? I don't know. Sometimes I, sometimes I think that in the church we can look at people and go, well, that person is special and that person has something I don't have and maybe we can look at that person with envy and go, why that person, why not me? I don't know the answer to that. Here's what I do know about Peter. Peter didn't always move with this kind of power and this kind of authority. In fact, at the end of Christ's life, he betrayed him three times. When Jesus needed him the most, when Jesus was being crucified, everybody abandoned him, including Peter, who denied him three times, one time to a little girl. That's Peter. And yet God restored Peter. Somehow something happened to Peter, but Peter was willing to do something that a lot of us aren't willing to do. And I don't know if there's a correlation between the power of God and what Peter was willing to do. Peter was willing to die for Jesus Christ. And he did. Legend has it that he was crucified upside down so he wouldn't die the same death that Christ died. 
He was willing to die. He was willing to be put in prison. He was willing to be persecuted for the cause of Jesus Christ. And people say, I don't know if I would be willing to do that. I don't know if I would be willing to die for my Lord Jesus Christ. And my question to you is, well, you're not gonna be asked to do that right now. And here's why. Not because we live in this great land of peace and not because we don't live in war and we don't live in places of the country where Christians are being persecuted. That's not why. The reason is this. How are you doing with the little trials in your life? God's not gonna expect you to put your life on the line for him if you constantly compromise him in all of the little things. People say, would I be able to endure that kind of persecution? And my answer is, I don't know. How do you do with the little tiny bit of persecution you might experience now? And if the answer is not so well, then probably when and if that day comes, you won't do so well then either. Peter was willing to do that. He was willing to die for his faith. He was willing to be persecuted. He was willing to give up everything for the cause of Jesus Christ. I get a silly kind of picture in my mind sometimes of us saying, I want that kind of power. I want that kind of power to pray and raise the dead. God, I want power. How come I've got no power in my life? And God sort of looks down and go, you ain't doing nothing. You don't need much power to do nothing, do you? You got exactly enough power to do nothing. If you want power in your life, give it all for the cause of Jesus Christ. So that's another thing that this story raises to me. The, the, the nature of us imitating and learning to be like Jesus until we actually start doing the things that Jesus does, learning to live and give all for the cause of Christ until, until God demonstrates his power through us because we're living on that front edge of ministry every day of our life. But these two people, for whatever reason, have gripped my heart. Simple people, ordinary people, people that often get overlooked, a cripple and a widow. Don't know much about Aeneas other than people, well-intentioned people, people who were Christians, people that were believers, disciples, they brought Peter to Aeneas. So he was probably a believer. He probably had some impact on the people of his life. They loved him, likely. Otherwise, why would they bring Peter to him? They went out of their way to introduce Aeneas to Peter. It's about all we know. And then this dear woman, Tabitha, who was known throughout the region, caring for people, caring for the poor, caring for the needy, making them clothes, caring for widows when she was likely a widow herself and likely without resources just like the rest of the widows were. Ordinary people doing ordinary things just like you and me. And when we go through the, co the course of our life Sometimes the ordinary things don't capture our hearts much, do they? Going to work every day, earn a living so we can raise our kids, enduring some maybe difficult issues in our marriage, figuring some things out, doing all that we can to learn about each other, sticking it, sticking it out, raising kids when we've been abandoned by a spouse, Raising grandkids when we've already raised children. Every time we go hammer a few nails for Habitat for Humanity or serve food at, at uh, King's Harvest or take some clothing to a shelter. Every time we kind of step out of our comfort zone to to uh, tell the gospel to somebody. And sometimes we do these things, we think to ourselves, man, I, I just, it seems, it seems so unimportant. It seems so ordinary. I remember when I was a young guy, 
I was, I was, my brothers and I were on the road a lot, so we were playing, we we're playing music all over the country, and I, I kept thinking to myself, we're gonna, we're gonna hit it big, man, we're gonna, and the only thing we hit big was our hair. This was in the 80s. <laughs> we hit that big, real big. Um, and I remember thinking someday, and I, and I, my dad had started this little country church up in Northern California, and, and then he had, he had, he had resigned from that church, and after 20 years of ministry, and took a church in Colorado Springs, and another guy had then become the pastor of it, and so I'm in my early 20s, and, and traveling around, and we're going to this church, and, and, um, and then I, every, every time we played close by, we'd travel all night, Saturday night, to, so, I, so we could be at church there. And we were, we were you know, kind of raggedy sometimes when we came in, there's no doubt. Um, and I remember thinking, someday, someday I'm going to park my tour bus on this, and I'm going to be a big rock star. I'm going to come to this little church. I'm going to make a big splash. I have all this money, and you know, I'm going to really help Jesus out. You know, the kingdom doesn't work that way, does it? We don't help Jesus out. The kingdom is made up, and I didn't always understand this, the kingdom is made up of ordinary people doing ordinary things, things that sometimes don't make us feel all that dramatic or like, you know, rock star preachers or musicians or what, you know, just simple, ordinary things. That's what the kingdom is made of. It's made of the Tabithas. It's made of the Aeneases. It's made of people like you and me doing simple, ordinary things. And it means a lot to Jesus. Whenever you think to yourself, my life, what is, does Jesus care about my life? The things that I do, is it important? Let me show you how important it is to Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. And it's hard for me to read them because I know what a lot of you are going through. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed means happy. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Think of that next time you quietly go down and feed a meal to poor people, to hungry people. You give somebody a little bit of money to help them. You go pray for someone who's sick. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God, the people of God. You got a lot of strife in your family, in your marriage, with brothers, with sisters, with parents, with neighbors. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, blessed are you, Jesus is saying, when you act like me. And here's what I want to tell you. If you feel sort of lost, unimportant, that your life doesn't make a difference, I'm here to tell you it does it makes a difference in dramatic fashion because the things that you do the duties that you quietly fulfill those acts of righteousness jesus at one point says if you do your acts of righteousness before men you've got your reward good for you but when you quietly fulfill your acts of righteousness quietly fulfill your duty as a husband as a wife as a father a mother a friend an employer, an employee, whatever your capacity is, a grandparent, when you quietly fulfill your duties, 
You move the heart of God. You matter. Church, don't ever forget that. The kingdom is upside down. That's what the kingdom is all about. Let's learn to live our life like Jesus Christ. And in doing that, we move God's heart and his hands. It's ordinary people doing ordinary things, being used by an extraordinary God. You matter. Got it? God bless you. Have a great weekend.